Hello, welcome to all of you who've logged on tonight. My name is Dorothea von Moltke. Uh, I am a co-owner of Labyrinth Books in Princeton, and I have been looking forward to tonight's conversation between Daphne Brooks and Tracy Smith for some time now. Um, we're of course here to celebrate Daphne Brooks's amazing new book, Liner Notes for the Revolution, uh, the intellectual history of black feminist sound. And here it is, the object. Uh, when we started to think about this event, Daphne and I, um, I asked her whom she might want to invite along as an interlocutor. And she sent me an email um, suggesting that we ask Tracy Smith because, as she wrote, and I'm quoting, the beauty of Tracy's Black feminist speculative poetics lines up with some of the ideas that I'm wrestling with in the book. Uh, what a powerful and beautiful frame for this conjunction, and how great also that Tracy, in fact, um, is able to join us and be with us uh, tonight. There has been a comment uh, in the chat for a few days now already on this site. And um, if you look over there, it says two phenomenal women. And that's right. So just a few housekeeping notes from me uh, before I introduce them and then I'll hand things over to them. Uh, I wanna begin with some thank yous uh, to our co-sponsors. We've had lots of help getting word out about this event from Princeton University Concerts, from the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton, uh, the African American Studies Department, and the Princeton Public Library. This event is one among many um, in a series of joint events with the library, uh, Labyrinth and the Library live streams, um, which you can find listed on both of our websites. Oh, and then there's also the program in Gender and Sexuality Studies at Princeton, who sent out a newsletter too. So I'm grateful to all of them. And now I want to point uh, out two buttons quickly at the bottom of the screen. Um, the long one is a link to our website where you can buy a copy of uh, liner notes and get 10% off on your entire order if you order, if you enter uh, Brooks as a discount code at checkout. If you prefer to order over the phone or by email, the information for that is at the top of the chat. And then the second button um, is the ask a question button. And I'm going to be taking the chat down during the conversation itself. So please put any questions that you have in, that, uh, in the queue by clicking on that ask a question button. Um, we want to leave plenty of time for questions and so seeing, seeing those questions drop in in that queue actually helps us gauge, uh, gauge that. So don't be shy, um, just line them up right there. And now uh, let me introduce those two phenomenal women. Um, Daphne Brooks left Princeton for Yale where she is professor of African American studies, women, gender and sexuality studies and music. Um, while, while she was here in Princeton, very memorably for me, on one occasion, she filled the Labyrinth Underground with girl rock bands. Um, so that's the kind of energy that she brings. Um, at any rate, Daphne's previous book to Liner Notes is Bodies in the Scent, Spectacular Performances of Race and Freedom, 1850 to 1910. And uh, Liner Notes is in fact part of a projected three volume study titled Subterranean Blues, Black Women's Sound Modernity. She's also currently the co-editor of the 33 and a third short books about albums series. Um, many of you will know Tracy Smith as the two term poet laureate of the US from 2017 to 2019. She is also chair of uh, the Lewis Center here at Princeton where she teaches creative writing. Tracy has published four collections of poetry, the most recent of which is um, Wade in the Water, and before that, Life on Mars, for which she won the Pulitzer Prize. I urge you also uh, to read her intensely lyrical memoir, Ordinary Light. And um, I'm excited that a fifth volume of poems, Such Color, will be published in the fall. So I hope we can celebrate that together when it comes out um, also. Now, before I pass the mic, as it were, and I'll do that in a second, I'll just say quickly, that reading Daphne's liner notes for me is slow, not because it's a big book uh, or because the 
eloquence, taut eloquence, loose uh, rigor of its prose keeps making me double back, though all of those things are true. It takes so long because I keep stopping to jump over to the liner notes playlist on Spotify, many, many hours worth of music, um, to listen to what I just heard on the page or to bring up a performance on YouTube that I just watched Daphne curate, as she would say, uh, of what her women of sound also do on the page. And then I realize I need to check out an essay by Fred Moten, or I have to reread Toni Morrison's Jazz, so I pick that up again, and on it goes. At every turn, um, you're offered the roots uh, and the intimate inspirations for this scholarship, along with its abundant discoveries. Um, and in that way, Daphne is modeling a new kind of cultural work, one that lifts up the shoulders that it stands on, which it seems to me is an acrobatics, a poetics, and a form of enacted politics all in one. And so if you're like me, pretty soon this book starts to curate your evenings and, you know, what could be better than that? So here now are Daphne Brooks um, with one click. And hi and welcome, Daphne. Hi. Thank you for that extraordinary introduction. Hi, Tracy. And hi, Tracy. Hello. Welcome to both of you. Hello. I'm so glad uh, to, to have you here and to get to listen to you now. So here you go. Thank you so much. Hi, Daphne. Hi, Tracy. Oh, Thank it's so good to see sharing you. this wonderful book with the world and for coming to let us hear your voice and reflections on it and and, and the world and and whatever you want to talk about tonight. Yeah. Well, I'm it's a true honor to be in conversation with you. And I keep telling you, you're one of my intellectual heroes. And I'm so glad that Dorothea read that um, the message that I sent to her because you were the first person I thought of in that, that place where I used to be <laughs> when I think about, especially how I hiked through the second half of this book, um, your work as um, you know, a, an, an author who produced one of the most moving and um, eye-opening and illuminating and electrifying memoirs that I've read in, in so long was was really um, a rock for me in this process. So on top of all of the poetry that I continue to love and teach all the time. So thank you. Thank you for being thank you. Um, so we thought you might kind of frame the book a little bit and then we can dive into some some conversation. Does that still sound good to you? That still sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you again to Dorothea and to Marna Seltzer, um, who I know was also instrumental in making this event possible. So um, I thought I'd, I'd just read just a little bit from the very first pages of the book. Um, and the book is just div divided into a side A and a side B. And so I thought I'd also maybe share just a couple of paragraphs from the beginning of side A so we get a, a sense of um, the arc of the book. Um, and then, you know, I'm excited to chop it up with you. So here we go. Quiet as it's kept, Black women of sound have a secret. Theirs is a history unfolding on other frequencies while the world adores them and yet mishears them celebrates them and yet ignores them, heralds them and simultaneously devalues them. Theirs is a history that is nonetheless populated with revolutionaries, turn of the century vaudevillian, Muriel Ringgold rocking her entirety in full costume as the sea, blues trailblazer Mamie Smith breaking the era of modern records wide open all crazy and staggily style love, Opera Ingenue and Brown rewriting best to Gershwin's Porgy. High Priestess Nina orchestrating a Brecht and Vile Tempest aimed at overturning Jim Crow. And slinky Afro-cosmopolitan Eartha staging her own geopolitical cabaret. It's a history wide enough to encompass rebel with her own cause, rock and roller Etta James in a fast car out on the open road. And folk historian Odetta going deep into scholar, thinker, rule breaker, Zora's precious vault so that the real work songs can begin. It's Teen Aretha and shimmering sequins attacking Al Jolson's Swanee and those glam ambassadors, the Supremes pointing us towards somewhere, 
so one day after a king had been slain. It's the body and soul of a grown ass musician building bridges over troubled water for her listeners. The electric kinetics of anime Bullock breaking free from domestic tyranny, funk philosopher Betty Davis inventing her own erotic lexicon and intergalactic trio LaBelle delivering Afrofuturist theory all up in the club. Theirs is a history of the utopic and the transformative, the strange and the strategically unruly. Diana reaching out and touching the hands of the multitudes in the Central Park rain. Afropunk godmother Grace striving Atlantic world nightlife right to the edge while polystyrene and skin work on burning the whole house down. It's Whitney's melisma lighting up post-civil rights America, and it's Ms. Hill with her renegade contralto scoring a thousand turn-of-the-century sorrow songs for the hip-hop generation. It's a hard-working H-Town new millennium storm system performing radical black pop feminism to fight catastrophe. And it's her avant-garde genius baby sis staging a blackest of black uprising right in the center of the Lily White Guggenheim. Theirs is a history of game-changing art that stands as an affirmation of our past, as well as the unrecorded future of sound, that which is booming in the not yet, the place where all those sisters of the yam are running us straight into the dawn. Liner Notes for the Revolution tells the story of how Black women musicians have made the modern world. It is the first extensive archival interrogation of what ethnomusicologist Christopher Small has famously referred to as the musicking, quote unquote, extending in all directions in our world, made by women who have been overlooked or underappreciated, misread and sometimes lazily mythologized, underestimated and sometimes entirely disregarded, and above all else, perpetually under theorized by generations of critics for much of the last 100 years. These critics and tastemakers, collectors, and far too many scholars have engaged in a long game, one that involves oversimplifying, simplistically romanticizing, and at key moments, rapturously cry me a river, sentimentalizing the complexities of Black women musicians' work. It is the problem of their hold on the narratives about Black women's sonic artistry that constitutes a significant portion of this book. But make no mistake, they are not the stars of this show. Rather, it is the remarkable sisters who have made, who, who both have made and have been thinking and writing about Black women's music for over a century now. They are the ones who stand front and center in this study, and they are the ones who have so fundamentally reshaped, reshaped structures of feeling and expressive cultural forms in the pop popular domain since the dawn of the 20th century that one would be hard pressed to imagine an American culture without their influence. But do we even know some of these sisters' names? These women, this book argues, our culture makers who often labor right before our very eyes and ears without our recognition of the magnitude of their import. And the revolution that they wage was one in which the articulation of more life could, for a dispossessed people, be sounded out in many registers and tied to the core meaning and vision of liberation itself. Implicit in so much of their work is the stirring and glorious declaration once made by Zora that you don't know us Negroes, quote unquote, so side A, for much of the last century, pop music writers and the latter-day institutions that support and promote their claims have been anything but kind to Black women musicians. Plenty of people would argue otherwise, citing, for instance, the long-running tendency of pop music writers to think in hagiographic hey, terms about the mothers and empresses, the queens, so many queens! and high priestesses who have dazzled and destroyed audiences from one generation to the next, and who have belted out the soundtrack to our interior lives as we face the uncertainty, the volatility, the exhilaration, as well as the sorrows of modern times. And they'd be right to call our attention to the ways that these sisters, so beloved the world over, are worthy of, mon of monarchical metaphors. They built kingdoms of sound for the people who remained largely unseen or misread, vilified and unloved for much of the 400-year crawl that constitutes the singular and more than a little bit terrifying experiment that would come to be known as America. Yet these sonically electrifying worlds are ones that were and still remain largely controlled and engineered by a marketplace that they've never run. It's an operation that made their sounds available to the masses and gave wide technological access to others to mimic and enjoy. At the same time, it was not a phenomenon built to last, 
which is to say that in spite of the mass and massive exposure and circulation of popular music made by black women, in spite of the varying ins instances of intense and sometimes rabid adoration, the kind that fosters fan hives and all sorts of obsessive idolatry, history reminds us that until quite recently with say, the death of an unprecedented icon here and the release of a watershed album there, there's has always been a culture marked as disposable, as less worthy of serious intellectual regard, writerly, writerly love, as it were, and institutional recognition. Such circumstances, small and culturally benign as they may seem to, to some, have real consequences, and the stakes could not be higher. They have everything to do with a grand culture forgetting who actually invented the music that you just can't get out of your head, who first designed and put down for the record those dangerous vocal phrasings that bespeak suffering and revolutionary survival, who first composed those rhythms that conjure nightlife abandon and juke joint self-making. This was music that was deemed precious, a fungible, fungible commodity that would fuel the luxurious and glamorous life of the masters the ones who own you in the recording industry, as Prince Rogers Nelson famously made clear. And ultimately, it was a writer's class, music critics, but also fans, collectors, and scholars that sprang up and eventually got caught up in the game too, championing and looking after what they defined as valuable, what they claimed spoke to them, what they couldn't live without, while often missing the broader and complex meaning, the urgency and origins of these sounds. Sometimes too, they missed deeply important artists altogether. They were doing a kind of intellectual labor that rarely receives attention for being what it is, a corrosive quotidian power play whose common parlance description taste making masks the fundamental and systemic ways that this writing about music created the conditions for new institutions, archives and museums to further codify common presumptions about cultural belonging who matters and who made things that we all supposedly value and believe to be worthy of care. In brief, they told tales to the pop world about who gets to appear in history and how. I think I'm gonna stop it there. There is a little anecdote that I give about going to the Rock Hall Fame induction ceremonies and having to sit through listening to John Bon Jovi and Howard Stern, but I don't think they should get the last word right now, so. Thank you so much for um, letting us kind of just enter into the prose. Um, the book is just so lyrical, so um, active and nuanced and reflective. And um, I feel and I hear so many registers and modalities of blackness in the, the very prose, mm -hmm. which is so, um, I think it's such a generous gift. Mm -hmm. It allows me to find myself and others um, a part of our extended community of Blackness in this um, work of criticism. Um, and it also invites me, and I wonder if it invited you as well as a Black woman to think about these trends aren't confined to the music industry. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a moving and powerful work to live with for a while. Um, it's also just so radically humanizing in its approach to thinking about culture as an extension of people, which of course we know that it is, but that's not often um, the last word that we get in terms of um, popular criticism. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about just getting your head around the scope of this project and, and its goals. And as Dorothea mentioned, it, it's part of something that will grow um, <laughs> Although my, my former dean of faculty, faculty said, said to me, um, I, I, I you doing doing rest, rest, rest home. home. <laughs> if you can <laughs> doing this, so I'm having a little bit of feedback right now. So I don't know if that is something, Dorothea, that we can work on, but I just, not, I, I just fixed it, I think. Okay, awesome. You know, sound. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, the way that I've talked about the shorthand um, description of this book is to ask people, you know, name, name, a, name a study, a sweeping study of Black women in popular music culture across the centuries, right, that, that documents their, their artistry and their virtuosity and, you know, their revolution, revolutionary interventions and the social fab fabric of American life. And, um, and then I say, this book isn't that. This book is the story of why we don't have that yet, <laughs> so, you know? And along the way, it's trying to 
you know, contribute to the possibility of many works like that. And I, and I really do want to, in terms of generosity and being, um, having a kind of intellectual humi humility, this is the moment to also reference the multiplicity of exciting new studies in Black women in sound that have been coming out. I can come back to them, but people should know that we are in a kind of exciting renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I initially tried to do the former. I was trying to write, when I first started working on this project when I was still at Princeton, um, I thought I was gonna do a kind of a critical study, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a trained as a literary and cultural studies scholar. So not any kind of an official historian. I, I love that um, Dortilla had given us the, the subtitle of the book is The Intellectual History of Black Feminist Sound, but it's The Intellectual Life of Black Feminist Sound, which I think is a little bit different. But as an interdisciplinary study scholar, um, I saw myself as trying to map a long tail that could you know, pull together all of the different methods that have been important to me in trying to think about Black women and sound. Um, but I kept running into all these critics. <laughs> I kept running to, into all of the ways that, um, you know, the narratives um, about Black women in popular music culture um, had been so wholly dominated uh, by white men, and that story had not been told. Mm -hmm. um, and because I, because I methodologically believe so much in trying to, as a performance studies scholar, um, think about the heterogeneity of performance events and everyone who is present for the event, right? Um, from the audience to the performer to, you know, all of the different um, constituents who are involved in the making of the event and then how it's documented by critics. Um, because I believe in the multitudes that um, inform how we experience performance, I wanted to be true to that and say, we can talk about the genius of Bessie Smith, but we also need to talk about Chris Albertson, who is actually, you know, was he just passed last year, but it, you know, was a wonderful champion of Bessie Smith's work. But um, there are, are, are ways that his imprint, um, you know, resonates across how her recordings are, are handled and, and regarded in the cultural domain, that that's part of the story too. And so I wanted to be able to tell that story. I want to make sure that the women were front and center, um, not only the musicians, but the feminist allies, black women and white women alike, who were invested in their music and cared for them in ways that, um, you know, hegemonic institutional structures of knowledge, you know, um, were not interested in doing. And I thought if I could front load that in side, I, side A, and then get to the problem of the critics in side B, my, my wonderful colleague, Michael Denning, said to me at one point when I was presenting on some work on the critics early on, he said, yeah, you know, they can't like dominate this thing. I was like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. They're coming, they're in the second half, you know? We have to go through them though, mm -hmm. right? And we have to address them. It's and really important how you do that too, because you're talking about the things that um, bolster the white male critical perspective a sense of youth, a sense of, you know, that certain fantasies, yeah. and nostalgias, we all are steeped in, in some way. Yes. Um, I would, and you write too, throughout the book about like your uh, complex relationship with what you call the white masculinist aural gaze mm -hmm. um, and the worrisome behaviors that, you know, kind of extend from that. Yeah. What did you have to unlearn or distance Ooh. yourself from in order to go after the mode of inquiry that you're you're interested in. Oh, Tracy K. Smith comes with the, <laughs> the bombshell questions. So what do I have to unlearn? That's a great question. Um, I'm gonna actually take it to Tony and then come back um, by saying that I had to re reaffirm my deep indebtedness to the 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 critical heft of what she was doing, not only as a novelist but in everything from now we see the body of work in the source of self-regard, but in playing in the dark, which I just taught again in my Toni Morrison seminar on Monday. And I, I realized, and I was teaching the Morrison seminar in fall of 2019, but I realized that, you know, playing in the dark was kind of, it was, it was a model for me in terms of how to, how to wrangle with um, this kind of, what does she call it? She calls it the, um, I want to go about investigating what makes intellectual domination possible is an early line in um, in playing in the dark, and that was certainly you know became 
um, a high priority in terms of my 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 writerly vision for this. And so, what did I have to what did I have to what did I have to unlearn? I felt that I had to know better the ways in which I was inculcated with the very things that we've been talking about. And I had to kind of, and by that specifically, and I talk about this in the book, you know, I was raised, I was, I was raised in this stew of cultural life in Northern California, like you, Tracy, with um, a family in which, are we both the youngest? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. That was also, that was another for me bond in reading your memoir and, and having that kind of long cultural memory in the family that was passed down to me. My, my parents, my dad listening to big band, my mother listening to Al Green, my older brother and sister, much older than me, who had their own kind of boomer, you know, Motown to everything, you know, that they were consuming. And for me, coming of age as a Gen X or in an integrated setting, there are beautiful books that have been written about this, like Maureen Mann's Write the Rock. Um, I, you know, immersed myself in a kind of um, alternative music culture in which I needed someone to talk to about that. And that's the long, short story of how I ended up reading a lot of rock music criticism Mm -hmm. on the weekends at Tower Records. So what I learned first from that mode of critical writing was um, a kind of... um, you know, um, intellectual arrogance and, um, uh, um, you know, presumptions about what should be valued in terms of culture. And I picked up that kind of voicing on the one hand in my own writing, but at the same time, I was inheriting from my sister, Black feminist thought, she's 10 years older than me, went to Mills College, moment of silence for the great Mills College in Oakland um, and bringing home on the weekends all of the Tonys, um, you know, and Gail Jones, which I shouldn't have been reading, and um, and Tazaki Shange. And so my obsession with and passion with being a Black feminist literary studies student and scholar was combined with this kind of passion for rock and roll and also a kind of being drawn to a mode of writing that had a had a kind of dominating force to it. And so I had to sort of disassemble the ways that that force operated at the expense of thinking um, much more expansively about, about culture. I think I always did, obviously, as a Black feminist scholar, but I think that writing I had to really hold up as an object of inquiry and think to myself, what is it formalistically and affectively about this mode of writing that is troubling to me and that I'm also seduced by. So it's a long way of kind of answering your yeah. question, you know? It's really, really a generous answer. Um, I, I, I want to hear your thoughts on how the shift in perspective that um, thinking about Black women's contributions to, to music um, as theory brings, um, that different valuing, how that informs your sense of the political and historic moment that we live in right now, because this book feels like a tool to me for um, every context in America, which feels so fraught, contested, and also so rich um, and in need of proper vocabulary and um, attention. Mm-hmm. So how do you see, um, I want to hold it up, this book as, um, you know, a handbook for, for oh. 2021? Wow. Also wonderful. I, I think that I, you know, I, I, I stand in the run of all of this other work that's being done in, in the opening of side B. There's a long meditation on my conversations with my, my kind of speculative conversations with um, Sadia Hartman's body of work um, that came out of doing um, a Barnard um, roundtable that a bunch of us were honored to participate in the week that um, that Wayward Lives Beautiful Experiments, um, you know, was released. And in going through that exercise, it enabled me to think um, much more immediately and urgently about the stakes of grappling with loss. Um, because part of the story, the central story of 
of black culture, in addition to black life writ large, is is one of loss. It's also about being able to 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 invent things and to improvise your way, you know, negotiate your way through the changes in in order to um, you know, in order to reimagine your life world. Um, but to reckon with loss, which we're doing in intensely newly felt ways in 2020 and 2021 um, is, is something that I wanted to, to bring to the center of a conversation about Black women's popular music culture, about what's been lost and how we've handled it, but also how the music itself is a primer for thinking through loss, as well as all the different kinds of creatives who meditate on Black women in popular music culture and are thinking about loss. So Carrie Mae Weems and Jackie Kay's marvelous speculative biography about Bessie Smith, which I write about um, and in which she's imagining um, the mythical lost trunk of Bessie Smith and what could have been in that trunk, you know, and it's everything from a wisdom tooth to, um, you know, a dress that has her sweat on it from when she was recording in the studio. Um, and so there's a kind of, there's a, there's a, there's an intimacy um, or I, I guess maybe I would say an ethics of intimacy with regards to thinking about how to manage loss um, that I that I tried to really uphold, not just in the second half of the book, but in how I was trying to handle respectfully and with humility the many different archives that I lived inside of of the women creatives and, and, and thinkers in this book. Everyone from Lorraine Hansberry, who of course Imani Perry has that groundbreaking um, biography on Hansberry and now Soika Colbert has another one that's coming out, fantastic. And I was thinking about her as a, as a cultural critic. Um, but, you know, any number of the musicians we can talk about from Abby Lincoln to Mary Lou Williams to a really kind of curious and interesting figure who I was trying to recuperate to the center of how we think about black women and sound, um, a white feminist New Yorker named Rosetta Wrights who um, dedicated her life to, to black women's cultural work and labor. Um, but I wanted to think about how to handle their archives and to recognize both what they were able to produce creatively and intellectually and also mark those moments in the archive where um, there is a kind of, uh, you're registering the loss of what their aspirations for. Rosetta Wrights wanted to do more even than beyond the, the independent record label that she started. She had a dream to write a book, that the book that I was talking about, right? And so to see the fragments of what she committed herself to with regards to black women's culture, I want to honor that. And we have to keep doing that each day that we kind of navigate this landscape called America is to deal with loss. So primer in that way. Yeah, that's amazing because it's so um, amazing to, you know, the gesture, this is speculative. There's the impossibility of that, which we will not find. Yes. Um, and then for that other type of American imagination, which isn't even searching to mm -hmm. recognize that there's a there's a field yeah. that's all mm -hmm. um, with things we haven't fully enough sought to ask about. Um, you, yeah. you, OK, so you got us to side B mm -hmm. and there are a lot of things I want to ask you about. Um, there's one beautiful thing that you say um, about um, Oh, his, his, histories that don't wish to be found. Oh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe also talk to us about um, Gishi yeah. and, and L LB? God, how much time do we have? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I appreciate that question. Um, I, I love these moments where, and I've referenced this already, but I'm now going to come to it in full, um, where I can hopefully model for our next generation of scholars the importance of being able to cite the, collect, uh, identify um, and, and narrate the collective work that we do as, as critics and as academics, right? Um, to sort of to, to defuse and de 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 destabilize and disassemble um, the kind of hegemonic authority of the author, critic, slash auteur is a big part of the ethics of this book. And so that's a long way of saying that, and I restaged this anecdote a little bit in the book, when I was early on um, sharing work on that I was doing on these so-called lost blues women and really trying to question what it means to be lost, lost to whom, um, 
my my dear friend and interlocutor Jack Halberstam spoke up and he said, I'm not going to do Jack's accent, which I do sometimes just because we're warm like that. But, you know, what if these women don't want to be found? You know, have you have you thought about that? Right. And what would it mean to honor um, or this is how I tried to extrapolate what Jack was pushing me on? What would it mean to honor um, the space in which we don't hunt for them? Right. We don't search for them, that we think about a kind of long transgenerational, transhistorical um, ethics of privacy uh, with regards to the figures in the archive, but are able to still do something with the history of the event of their disappearance, their loss, what they left behind. My dear friend and interlocutor, Black feminist critic, queer theorist, genius, Kara Keeling has written a piece that transformed how I thought about this. Um, it was originally um, an article called Looking for M that's now in her latest book. Um, but that is, she really kind of works through this theory of looking looking after um, the figures who are left behind in the archive and the ones that we we can only imagine are there, but we, we can't touch. You now we can't, we don't know their names, right? And that was that was one of the most important creative um, and critically generative turns in writing the project because it was then about problem solving methodologically. Well, if I'm not gonna look like these dudes do obsessively for Gishi Wiley and LV Thomas, who left behind six extraordinary blues recordings, um, six sides, I should say, um, on the Paramount Race Records label. Um, if I'm not gonna try to find out more about them, um, is there another way of telling the story of how they resonate in history? And for me, it started with thinking about the records themselves, the actual material objects, the scratches on them, who made those scratches before this whole generation of um, blues record collectors, almost all white men, um, really went deep into um, Southern and some Atlantic seaboard communities um, you know, paying paying to be able to purchase these records from working class black families and communities and black women. So if I didn't do that, if I didn't go on that hunt, what else what else can I say about this moment? And and that was the the turning point for me in thinking about someone like my mother, Juanita Catherine Watson Brooks, who's going to be very sad that she I wasn't told I didn't tell her to log on for, to this. She likes to be here for these things. She's ninety four now in California. She grew up in the Jim Crow South and for her 90th birthday in Palo Alto, huge soiree. I'm the academic, so I get charged with doing her oral history. Um, right in the middle of her oral history, she starts talking about going to the record store in Texarkana in the late 30s and early 40s with her girlfriends and going into listening booths. And my first reaction was, God, you gave me such a hard time for going to Tower Records and then coming back and playing The Clash too loud. And now I'm hearing that we have so much in common. Um, but it was it was a, an alternative way of trying to think about the life world of these records um, and to think about all the stories that our wonderful graduate students um, can go digging for now that we need to keep digging for. Now, I will say one other thing very quickly about this. This has been very interesting. It brings us back to the critics. Some would call them the villains. <laughs> there, was, there was a critic who uh, very recently on the social meds, I'm not on them, um, but I heard about this, um, said, you know, Daphne Brooks, she wrote this article in the New York Times, this was in, anticipated the book, about Black women and girls listening to Mamie Smith's crazy blues. How does she know this to be true? I need numbers. I need statistics. I need evidence, right? Okay, so we could get caught up in, uh, you know, the hegemony of you know, certain forms of knowledge, right? Being the fool's errand of right, providing right, right, right. Data when requested. Right. But it, what I said, uh, not to him, I said to other people, I said, oh, so-and-so, this book is not for him, but it's all about him. So, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Simon in my head a little bit, like reworking, you're so vain, but anyways, so... Um, well, it, what's really so beautiful about the way that you bring your mother into the book is that it's you're interweaving the known history with what you have 
asked her about and, and learned from her experience the kinds of things that never make it into the data that, you know, that, yeah. that you were challenged yeah. about. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about building that, that, that mm -hmm. part of the book? And sure. this is a book that really, um, you know, as a writer, I, I like to believe that there are certain books that enlarge their authors, that allow them to claim a larger, uh, not only space of the self, but of the culture in which the, mm -hmm. the book is, you know, going to be be born. Mm -hmm. And this this feels like one of those books. I wonder if that's true. Do you see it as something that enlarged you in a way? Mm -hmm. And um, regardless of what your answer to that is, tell me about what it meant to bring in this other part of your life into the into the research. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I do think it enlarged me in the sense of feeling that affinity for my mother's experiences in another time and place with regards to, you know, building Romans of black girlhood um, and just being able to, to see her and to see her generation of friends. She got very teary when I was reading a draft of this section just at the moment when I started reading her girlfriend's names. Um, and, you know, to have her girlfriend's names be legible and, and audible um, in history, um, you know, expanded my sense of, you know, connective tissue, right, to that history, right? So, so that's been a, a, a big and, and mighty and awe-inspiring task. Um, and I mean, really that part of the book too, all praise to Toni Morrison. Um, I, I came back down to Princeton. I've been back once since I left um, and it was 2018. It was a couple of weeks after Aretha Franklin had passed away. I was trying to reach her to see if I could, um, speak with her on my way to visit her papers and talk with her about her own memories of of growing up with music since it's 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 kind of embedded in the foreword to jazz she's primarily talking about her parents but i wanted to kind of think about the the transgenerational politics of what kinds of knowledges um she she absorbed by way of the sounds in her home and from her mother um, which it turns out was in the archives as well. She talked about it in some of her lectures and it ended up in the book and in another piece that I wrote for a volume that Marna and Dorothea and the great Scott Burnham have invited me to be a part of. Um, but I think, you know, Morrison really long ago, long ago became instructive to me vis-a-vis -vis jazz in just, um, you know, giving us a portal through which we could start to trace this longer, thicker history of what Black girls, um, you know, material and sociocultural lives could look like, right? That that really anticipates something like Wayward Lives, um, Beautiful Experiment, Sadia's book, which I had happily pointed out, I felt like they're so deeply in conversation with each other. Um, and so I think that jazz, to answer your question, was sort of the pathway into this part of the book. Um, and there's so much beautiful work, great that everyone's at Princeton go to her papers to see the ways that she was kind of experimenting with and rehearsing how to think about the character of Dorcas in jazz as, you know, the, the teenage girl that, um, that she's always been interested in, you know, across many of her works, whose, um, you know, deep um, complexity in terms of, you know, affective subjectivity um, is so often um, undocumented and uncared for. Um, so she was she was really the heuristic for trying to think through this portion of the book in every way. Yeah, it's really beautiful that bridge you build between you know Morrison's imagination, history, and your mother's life, and that's kind of the. I remember when I first began to read African American literature, mm -hmm. which wasn't until college. Mm -hmm. um, feeling like the bridge was was beginning to be formed for me yeah. to understand the the connection between the people that I knew mm -hmm. and the world that of course mm -hmm. they they extend from but also help to build. So that's like such a beautiful um, moment within side B. Um, you talk about collaboration a lot. You've mentioned Sadia um, and, and interlocutors mm -hmm. and in part B of the book you you write um, the art of a disenfranchised people demands our scrupulous collective attention, our communal care. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes me want to ask you, 
A, about collaboration, but also about your thoughts on ritual mm -hmm. um, and self-care, which also seems to be um, relevant to, mm -hmm. to the work of the book. Mm, thank you. That's lovely. Um, so first of ritual, I will say the rituals involved in the, the practices of listening for me have for a long time now been deeply collaborative. And one of my greatest interlocutors, the fantastic genius Alexander Vasquez, former Princeton faculty member as well, taught me so much about, um, you know, a kind of ethics of listening um, that involved, again, this kind of mindfulness about the ways that we are never alone in our listening practices, um, that there is a kind of mutual reciprocity and how we engage with the sonic object and the sonic event in question. Um, and, you know, to, to be able to um, embrace um, risk and openness, to open yourself up to um, the, 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 the performative event broadly, but the sonic event specifically, in a way that allows you to kind of to, to handle it with care. And so that is a ritual. There are some specific exercises that I will say have been very important to my growth as a writer. I've talked about this a lot recently in the public space, but the same year I started teaching at Princeton, September, 2001, um, in the spring of 2002, the Princeton alum, Eric Weisbard and his partner, Ann Powers, um, they're both superstar rock, critics. They went to graduate school at Berkeley and they started a conference that many of us went to and continue to go to out in Seattle every single year in the spring called the, it's the annual pop music conference. Originally the Experience Music Project Museum. Um, the, the most edifying and um, enlightening and um, transformative writing experience I ever had that has something to do with ritual and writing about music which I think is also a form of self-care, it can be, um, came in 2004 when the, the, the poet Josh Clover um, curated a session, he's also a, a scholar, E.C. Davis, he curated a session called um, Critical Karaoke, in which he asked a number of us, Graham Marcus, who's a longtime interlocutor, interlocutor and, and um, mentor to me, um, and Powers, several other folks, pick a song at some point in your life um, you feel it, felt a deep attachment to the song. You could love it. You could hate it. Write about it. Write about it critically. Write about it autobiographically. Do whatever you want to do with it. But when you deliver your remarks, it cannot be any longer than the song itself. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. And um, it it challenged me to think about moving um, rhythmically, temporally. Mm -hmm. Um, dialectically, obviously, you know, in relation to, you know, the sonic object in question. Mm -hmm. And whether I'm thinking about it or not, it's just how I write now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a form of intellectual self-care because it's about, um, you know, caring for your senses and, you know, being able to let all of your desires, you know, put all your desires on the table in relation to the cultural object and then kind of take them apart, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was super important to me. And then I'll just say about collaboration that, um, oh, wow, look at that. Where is the time going? <laughs> I know. It's yeah. Funny. I'll say about collaboration that I've been very lucky to be a part of the, the historic Columbia University Jazz Studies Working Group for um, over a decade now. And that is a space where, you know, it was started by Robert O'Mealy, um, Farrah Griffin, Farrah Jasmine Griffin, who's so important to my thinking as a scale Wald, I should say too, um, although she's not in the group, Brent Edwards, George Lewis, Robin Kelly, Fred Moden, all the heavyweights. But we, we come together and, you know, are spending time with the music. And I will say in terms of, again, extending, extending that generosity, I had a graduate student. She's now not a graduate student anymore. At the time, she's a graduate student at Chicago when I gave a portion of this talk. Um, and I was talking about Gishi and Alvi, and I was talking about the carceral state and blues women's music. And she said, you know, it seems like you're spending time with the women who were doing time. And I was like, well, there it is, right? So co we collaborated, right? We we, did, we engaged in a duet, which also at Chicago, they said, it seems like you're duetting with the archive. <laughs> so duets are important. I feel like we've we've engaged in a duet tonight, Tracy, which is the great honor 
Oh, it's it's all my honor, and I wish we could just keep talking all night, but yeah. I guess we have to uh, share. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I'm excited to hear what questions are coming in. Well, I really, I really hate to um, come back up because, in, in some ways, you know, I just want to keep listening. And in part, I'm coming up also simply to say to everyone that. Um, it can be hard to listen to something that's absorbing and also to formulate a question at the same time. Uh, but if you have one, uh, put it in the in that little, you know, click on the ask a question button and just um, type it into there and, and we can pull from that cue. So I mostly want to just flag that again in case there are questions in the audience, but not at all to truncate you, Tracy, um, um, if you have if you have other questions you still want to ask. I'll say that, you know, I'm thinking we might take it if questions come from the audience, we'll take it a little past the hour. And then if uh, anyone has to leave and wants to come back and listen to the Q&A, you can do that for a few days on this uh, site. And um, we'll also put this conversation up on our YouTube channel, just so we don't have to make seven our, a hard stop. Um, so this is an interruption to say, don't feel interrupted. Okay. <laughs> and feel free if there's something else in the arc of, of your of your um, questions, Tracy, that you still wanted to ask, just please do. Okay, yeah, I, I have some more questions. And um, there's a passage in side B where you write, um, we need to remain prepared for the arrival of the ones whose names we don't even know yet, whose names we may never know, but whose presence informs the very core of our existence and permeates the privilege that we bear. Yeah. Um, that gave me such thrill, fear, joy, awe, yeah. um, felt mythic. Can you, can you talk yeah. about that sense a little bit? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, in the intro, I, 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 I talk about, and, and this was, I was challenged by some grad students at Brown a long time ago in ways that were really exciting to me when they said, you know, you, you write in a real triumphalist way about popular music culture. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to own that. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not an Afro peasant. We can talk about that. Um, although I, I think that those debates have been crucial to black studies in a lot of ways, clarifying. Um, so, you know, in the, in the beginning of the book, I'm, I'm laying out my kind of my interest in thinking about why the triumphalist matters and thinking about black performance, um, as well as failure. Um, and by the, by the time I'm, I, I'm trying to remember where I, I specifically wrote that in the book, but I know that by the time I was working on the side B, I, I was, you know, again, kind of moving through these questions about loss and um, really just rocked to my core by a performance by the great Cecile McLaurin Salvant, new, newly minted MacArthur fellow, greatest jazz vocalist of her generation. And this 30 minute performance that my partner and I saw her deliver um, at Jazz at Lincoln Center in which she covers Deli Rome Morden's murder ballad, which is a completely and thoroughly profane <laughs> Right, spectacularly violent, um, you know, queer, you know, Bildung's Roman. In the end, it's about a, a black woman who, who does time and who comes to recognize her own pleasure um, in in the context of that subjugated world. And that was a real, just moment in which I wanted to think about what Cecile was doing as a performer to call attention to the, the kind of the metonymical figures and scenarios that are linked to this moment in the murder ballad narrative that we, we can't know about. We can't, we don't have access to knowing about all of the different protagonists in that song, right? Or, or what the protagonist embodies, right? Across time. And I wanted to hold that space for them, that this is a song that is um, both very specific to what Jelly Roll Morton had excavated um, through his kind of vernacular work as a musician, um, but it's about all of those other women for whom um, we don't have the records as, as so many of our, our beautiful black feminist historians have shown us of late um, to, um, to actually engage with more fully in terms of knowing their life worlds or being able to touch or um, or recognize and respect their life worlds. 
So that was where that that line came from. Um, but it's also it's the ethics of the second half. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our our students talk about it all the time. You know, about holding space, right? And I'm like, okay, let's let's try to 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 do to do many things at once here and pay very close and specific attention to the performance, but to also hold space for this broader historical imaginary that is, you know, Christina Sharp famously called it wake work, you know, around um, our proximities with the ones who are no longer here. Mm -hmm. It feels so profound at, at this time where the loss we're reflecting on is so active and rapid. Mm -hmm. um, that that you know, I want to think of like a second coming is being invoked by what you've just talked about. Mm -hmm. How can we we fold time in a way to to make space for something as powerful as that? Um, which yeah. reminds me, I wanted to ask you about the revolution in the mm -hmm. title. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. So also, what you just said was very exciting to me because it does call attention to the ways that I became um, interested in talking about these musicians, this generation of musicians, Rihanna Giddens, Cecile McLaurin, Sylvain, Valerie June, the classical vocalist, Julia Bullock, um, Jamila Woods, who is, you know, a hip hop vocalist, songwriter, was an Africana studies major at Brown. I just interviewed her, um, but how they operate like their forebears as archives. Um, when we didn't have, you know, a Smithsonian museum on the mall, when we didn't, when our, when our works weren't cared for in the Library of Congress, right? We've always known, we've known that we've had um, the, the musicians themselves and, and Black Sound as a way to archive that past and to hold on to it as a kind of second coming, a repeated second coming. So, so thank you for that. Yeah, the revolution is, um, I hope, both a revolution in writing, how we write about Black women and sound. Um, and it's also, um, it's the revolution um, instigated by the culture workers, the creatives, and the thinkers um, who were caring for Black women's um, musicianship when when other folks weren't. So it's an it's a it's a it's a it's an intellectual revolution that's being documented in the book. But it's also formalistically and met metal methodologically, I hope, hailing readers into thinking about what are the ways that we can activate our own revolutionary sensibilities and how we handle and regard and think about and critically really live inside of Black women's sounds. Mm -hmm. It's so exciting um, because you, you just mentioned Rhiannon Giddens and um, Valerie June as like two contemporary artists who are bringing the archive into the action, you know, the engagement yeah. with listeners and mm -hmm. um, our work is is something that has to stretch itself to become relevant in you know critical discourse um and for me the niche of poetry but our mm -hmm. problems are so big that it's got to stretch beyond that as yeah. well in the same way that you know policy is not enough it will not save us we've got to find these other means and methods and i feel like you offer so many of them and you just mentioned the you know museum of african-american culture and history are there other sites mm -hmm. that you um that you recognize um, that are, are growing or becoming more um, inviting that bring normal folks, civilians into archival spaces or into an awareness of, you know, what we call the archive. Yeah, two ways I would think about that. One is we're, we're very closely watching the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, a, a site that I referenced early on at the beginning of our conversation um, and this historic new ballad that uh, of, of potential inductees this year that includes more Black women and more women artists than ever before. So we'll see what happens with that. And there are really good people that work on the ground in the educational division of the Rock Hall who've been lobbying for changes for many years. I mean, I could go deep walk into talking about the Rock Hall for a long time. I won't do that. I will just say it's more powerful in terms of how we experience the culture industry than people want to think. I think they think it's just this boomer thing. <laughs> You know, in which all of Bruce Springsteen's entire family and band are constantly inducted and reinducted. <laughs> but it's so much more than that. Um, but I, you know, I'm really interested in grassroots archiving. And um, I started a few years ago with my wonderful colleague in music, um, Brian Kane, a working group called Black Sound in the Archive. And that it came out of an event that I had done with the rock musician Jack White 
who uh, his record label um, assisted in reissuing the entire body of um, Paramount Records um, recordings. Um, this was back in 2013 when I was still at Princeton and we did an event at the New York Public Library with Grail Marcus and with some other folks. Um, but when they did the second reissue or the second volume, um, I invited Jack to, um, to Gale along with several other folks, including um, Scott and Dean Blackwood who run Revnot Records. Um, and what we did was, we did it the first time, but I felt like it worked even better the second time. We played the records and we, we held a space around just listening to the records, not talking over them, which we do in critical karaoke, but, but listening to them together. And we, we filled a hall, um, you know, 800 people um, doing that. But that really came from um, a couple of different places. My wonderful interlocutor, the Black feminist um, film historian Jacqueline Stewart, who has a home movies project in Chicago, mm -hmm. in which she crowdsources people to come and bring your home movies and we'll watch them together, right? I started thinking about what, could we do that with albums or could we do that with, with recordings that are meaningful in people's personal lives? And, you know, pay attention to um, you know, start from, start from the bottom. Now we're here as Drake would say, but start, start from the bottom up with the recording itself. Who was in the room? He, she, and Elvie. Who were the producers? Do we know their names? Do we not know their names? Where are they, where were they recording, right? What are they doing instrumentally? You know, how are they duetting with each other? What is the time and place of Grafton, Wisconsin in 1930, right? And then how are we experiencing this in New Haven in 2014, right? And that's, I think that, hopefully begins to address some of what you're talking about, Tracy, about the bigness of the, these things that exceed, right, you know, our, you know, policy, right? They're, they're about um, paying attention to the scale and intensity and intimacies of our relationship to culture and how culture makes us, how we might be able to unmake certain kinds of culture that are negating, you know, our experiences and to, um, you know, to document our, our life worlds in, in really vibrant ways. So I dream of being able to do that more often. We did it through Black Sun and the Archive and brought in Cecile, we brought in Rhiannon, and we brought in Valerie, um, Jason Moran, other folks. And I would love to see that happening all over the country, right? So to, like what Lonnie Bunch does with the museum, you know, bring me your objects yeah. and, let's, and let's, let's be together with the object. It's so important that. because it brings the, all of the things that precede cognition yes. to the space. Mm -hmm. And then we also bring a vocabulary to the surrounding um, reality as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I feel like this conversation, I'm receiving it as a gift. And uh, I think that the silence in the, <laughs> the question queue, no, I mean, this is in some ways um, uh, a, um, a function of, of a listening, you know, listening audience, listening to the two of you. Uh, and and it feels open ended. It feels incredibly generous. Um, and and so uh, you know, I want to thank you for all this thought, all this. I could use many words from your book. You know, all this care uh, that there. It's really you said vocabulary, Tracy. You give us such a vocabulary for uh, that we can take to to our listening, to our reading, to um, and maybe to our making, because that's another division that I feel uh, in your writing sort of breaks down between scholarship and creativity. Mm -hmm. And um, and and in that way, it, it opens, uh, uh, I think, possibilities of imagining um, different writing, different research. And I, I can't believe that I talk about having to unlearn. I can't believe that I had that slippage from, you know, intellectual life to intellectual. No shade, no shade at all. <laughs> no, but it's, but it's so interesting, right? You know, that it's, that, that I slipped yeah. that way when in fact, um, the intellectual life of sound, uh, this is really what it's about. It, the book is about the life of the sound and living with sound mm -hmm. and the, the, the sounds of these extraordinary women, um, and, and sharing that. So with that, maybe I'll end by just again with gratitude for um, having shared all of that in this book, uh, Daphne, and for having shared your conversation with us tonight, Tracy and Daphne. Um, it's been really special for me. And um, so warm thanks. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Tracy. This has been a really lovely way to come back to Princeton. So, you know, I'm, I'm don't, really... let it, don't let it substitute. We, um, <laughs> I would love to have you in our in our bookstore <laughs> in, at Labyrinth um, for another occasion. There are two more volumes coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Be well. Stay okay. healthy. Right. And good night.